Americans have been. I'm Bev Smith, and I've traveled to the Holy Land and a very special place called Demona, Israel, to bring you this special edition of our voices. Since 1967, hundreds of African Americans have been returning to Israel, stating that they have a claim, a rightful claim, as Hebrew Israelites to the Holy Land. The debate continues as the U.S. and Israeli government ponders the question, why Israel and not Africa? Israel. It's called the holiest of holy lands in the world, the land of milk and honey, the place where Moses led former slaves out of bondage. It's a land where politics and religion have gone hand in hand for thousands of years. It's no surprise that a group of African Americans, descendants of slaves themselves, would seek out the promised land for their freedom. Frustrated with America's racism and feeling disenfranchised from American society, they journeyed to Israel for a taste of freedom. I wanted to know why these blacks felt they had a claim to Israel. So I went to the city of Demona where they settled, and I learned it began with a dream, a vision had by Ben Ami, the man they call the anointed spiritual leader of the African Hebrew Israelite. How did you know that the voice and the vision was truly sent from God? I did not know. You know, that's the key element to faith. See, the words were so powerful when the angel Gabriel came to bring the message that it was time to start the journey back. I did not know. As a matter of fact, I felt like Moses in the wilderness of sin. I really wanted to talk a little bit more to Gabriel and to ask him to show me his credentials and to pose the question to the Creator. How would I know if these things would truly come to pass? But that was it. I had to walk out on the water by faith, not knowing if these things truly would come to pass or not. There was no further message at that time, except that it was time to declare the Exodus in 1967. There I was in February of 1966, pondering, how would I convince any significant number of African Americans to, in fact, leave the United States in less than two years. But did you question in your soul and in your spirit why Israel and not Africa? Or was it one and the same to you? you know, at that time, you know, that again, that I knew that Israel was northeastern Africa, you know, only to be separated by the Suez Canal. You know, but there were so many things that I did not know at that time when the word of God did come. Ben Ami says the message spoken to him was so powerful that his mission would guide him on a journey through Liberia, then onward to Israel. Why through Liberia? Why not a plane directly to Israel? Because we had to sojourn. The words in the book of Revelation had forewarned us that we would have to sojourn in the interior of Liberia as our fathers in the wilderness of sin they had to sojourn there in preparation for their entry into the promised land. We had to prepare ourselves in the wilderness of Liberia. And as we go back now historically once again, I did not know that it would be Liberia. It says that we should return to the promised land in the same manner that we had journeyed from the promised land. Under the spiritual leadership of Ben Ami, the first pilgrims made their way to Liberia. It wasn't an easy journey, and they suffered the raft of the jungle. It was an inconvenience they were willing to endure because the alternative was life in America. I remember the bush, <laughs> you know, where we lived at. I remember things like um, almost getting bit by a snake. I remember being attacked by driver ants. I remember the little chickens that used to run through the house, put through a little tent and be up in the kitchen. And I remember my friends. I remember my grandmother in her home, and... Your whole family went? Yes. She remembers snakes. Why Liberia? Liberia was, in 18, 1821, set up for freed slaves by the United States government. We didn't know where to go. When we decided, when the word came to us that we had to go back to, to the United States, go back to Africa, we didn't know where to go. We were young men. But 
someone stood up and said, Liberia is the place. Why Liberia? Because that's the place where it has, has an open door policy for black Americans. And so then that's the direction that we went. That was the West Coast. We knew we were picked up on the West Coast, and we were going back, retracing our steps. And at the same time, fulfilling this, uh, the prophecies, going back by way of the wilderness to be tried by the God of Israel. I wondered what would make people believe Ben Ami's vision. And in most cases, it came down to personal convictions and wanting change. But you have homes, you have families, you have ways of life. You know nothing about this new land, whether you will be accepted or what. What makes you decide to give it all up? I'm looking at you to ask the question. Well, I'll have to go back to Chicago, too, and then my uh, learning about the exodus, what we call the exodus, which is leaving the part of America, going to the land of Israel because this was our home, it was the promised land. And learning that we were not uh, Americans, that we were brought to America as slaves. We were never uh, American citizens like that. We were more like American subjects. I was working at a company called the Wrigley's Trend Gun Factory. I'd been working there some 14 years. Thought I was kind of secure, but it was something from within upon hearing the word from Ben Ami that he had received the vision from the God of Israel that it was time to begin the journey back to Israel. And it was something about that that I guess it would have to be God himself that I knew I had to go. You didn't say, is this the voice of God, or is this Charlton Heston? No. I based it on, on facts. As we began to study and to learn and to be taught in, from the Bible, which we see as a, a, a history book, the most authentic history book that we could find, even today. And we began to trace our history from that book. And that began to open up so many channels in our minds that the calling was there. The calling was by the prophets of old. It was always there. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verse 1 through 7, it says that when all these curses, and we know we were under curse because there's no way that we could have been in the condition that we were in without being cursed by God. And so now you're in Liberia. Mm -hmm. Your children are in Liberia. And then, but your goal is to get to Israel. How do you translate Liberia to Israel? Well, um, we're yet being chartered by the Holy Spirit and the, and the prophecies of the God of Israel. Yet being chartered. Yes, you see, the prophets of old laid out a charter the way back for us. And so, we were to go through the wilderness, as written in the book of Ezekiel, and, and there in the wilderness we would be tried by the Holy One of Israel and, and pleaded with face to face. And so Liberia, we didn't go into the uh, capital city, Monrovia, but we went 110 miles into the bush. When I say bush, I mean jungle, <laughs> raw jungle. The grass would grow so fast, as soon as you would cut it, you, know, so you could see it growing back. <laughs> so there we went, and with tents, very green, near fights, not knowing, really, not going, we didn't spend too much time overnight in the forest preserves. But here we were in the bush, really not knowing how to handle ourselves. Because we, we arrived at a time, I think it was close to the rainy season, and, and when it rained on those tents, she didn't say that I'll give you the whole story, but the water came through the tents. You couldn't keep anything dry. No, no, until we became, the Liberians taught us, well, you need to build a rafter to sit them on. Oh, you say the Liberians taught you. Yeah. Was there an automatic welcome home, brother, from them? And you all can join in now. I, I don't want to point, well, this is not a classroom. <laughs> and I couldn't give you directions anyway. This is not a classroom, but I want you all to join in and have okay. a conversation. Great. And to the young ones, with the driver ants, you can remember, join in. Go ahead. Well, 
Upon our arrival, I, my family, I went to Liberia myself and five children. Just myself and five children. I left my former wife, which she refused to accept anything that I was talking about. I said I was crazy and dust and dust and dust. So, so I took, you took the children? I took the children. And I left. Today it would be called kidnapping. <laughs> 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 The oldest one was 11 years old and the youngest one was 9 months. You took five kids without a woman to the bush of Liberia during the rainy season because you heard God and you were on your way to Israel? I was on my way to Israel. Do you wonder, darling, why she called you crazy? <laughs> When you come to Israel, there are papers that must be had. There are proper identification that must be had. There is the government that must look at these papers and allow you in. You didn't have the papers, did you? So what did you do? Let's, let's, let's hear from you. What did you do? <laughs> well, we came, and we were, I was in the second group. We came in two groups after Prince Gabriel had came in I was 1968, you think? I came back to 69. There were two groups that came. I was with the second group. And the first group that came in, uh, which um, I was in, and they held them there at the airport for, uh, what, 24 hours 24. or something before they would even, you know, made, res made uh, places for them. When I came... Hold that for a moment. You, you had all your children and you had to stay at the airport? Yes. The baby was four months old. And, uh, I, I had five children by that time. And we had to, they took us to a secluded part of the airport and told us to have a seat while they went on. Prince Gaspiahu met us there while he was making arrangements for us to be accepted under the law of return. And um, so we spent the night there. and. Um, People in the airport were bringing us sandwiches and drinks and bottles for the baby. And uh, people, all people in the airport were crying and they were saying, the people who come home, the people who come home. And These are is white yes. Israelis. Yes. 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 So wait. <laughs> <laughs> white Israelis recognized that you were the people. Right. Yes. Right. The right. government of Israeli held you up? Yes. At that time. Arriving into Israel didn't go as smoothly as they expected. The Israeli government was not anxious to welcome them, and so I asked the ambassador at large of the African Hebrew Israelites, Prince Asiel ben Israel, to explain why. So when we appeared on the scene here in Israel, they were prepared to receive us if we were nice Negroes and would accept the definition of how they defined us. But when we said that we were the descendants of the biblical Israelites, we then took charge of our destiny. And that began the problem because now we were free African Americans talking and defining our future, not according to the past of someone else's definition, but how we now received and perceived ourselves. Obtaining Israeli citizenship has been a continual battle for the African Hebrew Israelites. It's been nearly 30 years and still no citizenship. They were surprised by the delay because Israel's law of return guaranteed citizenship status. But the law of return was clear. Yes. The law said that if you have a claim to the land, you are a citizen. Claim to the land was spelled out. One, you must be born of a Jewish mother. Did African Americans from Israel, on their way to Israel, fit in anywhere in the law of return? Absolutely. In 1969, when we first arrived here, the law of return simply said you had to believe that you were a Jew in your heart and worship and keep the laws of the God of Israel and the state. We met the total criteria from December of 1969, but by March of 1970, the law was changed to read that you had to be born of a Jewish mother or convert to Judaism according to Halakha, a European, a European form of Judaism. They tried to factor us out of it because now the door was open because we came basing it on biblical truth and not traditions of man that established who were the true descendants of this land. It seemed to me that in order for the African Hebrew Israelites to become citizens, they needed allies in the Israeli government. 
The first ally was Jacques Amir, who was a member of the Knesset and later the mayor of Demona. What made you decide to help blacks in Demona here in Israel? The problem was not the decision. The problem was that he was the mayor by election. That today we have direct uh, elections. And he felt that the responsibility of the city of Dimona and what happens in Dimona rested on his shoulders. Because the citizens, they didn't just choose his party, but they chose him personally. And he knows that many people in his party, they, uh, of the opposite party, chose Begin, and that he was from the opposing party in Dimona as the mayor. I asked Mr. Amir why was the Knesset concerned with the African Hebrew Israelites living in Demona? The, one of the biggest problems so was between what happened, what they were called at the time as the black Hebrews, that the first one, arrivees received uh, status as new immigrants. Uh, it, at that time, it was the Minister of Interior, Shapir, and Yigal Alon, who was from the Labour Party, and he was the Minister of Absorption. After the first group was absorbed in Dimona and received the, the assistance of the Ministry of Absorption, and others decided to come. And they didn't receive the... Uh, they didn't receive the benefits of new immigrants as the first arrivals had. But they came to Dimona. And so they came to a city where there was no uh, budget for them, and really no place for them. And the city municipality was not rich. They didn't have a budget to handle the influx. The African Hebrew Israelites were placed in the city of Demona to discourage them. It is a city that is a refugee melting pot, and their first living conditions were poor at best. There were too many people in one apartment. They were cooking for a number of people. They were using uh, bomb shelters, converting them to places of use. And the citizens of Demona saw that as a disturbance to the normal lifestyle. And they were concerned that their neighborhoods, the quality of neighborhoods, would be uh, decreased. I also spoke with the current city spokesman for the city of Demona, Mati Kinyan. He said the relationship between the African Hebrew Israelites and the city of Demona is a good one. If that is the case, I asked, why was it taking so long for them to become citizens? If it was up to us. It wouldn't take so much long, so long for them to get citizenship. But the things that we do, also to help the community in the direction of um, citizenship, I would like to explain that two to three years ago there wasn't a school for the children in the community, and we did. We did very diligent work that the Hebrews would, would receive education like all the other children in Dimona. That 
We want all the children in Demona to receive good education like the children in Tel Aviv. When we talk about the children of Demona, we speak of also the children of the Hebrew community. How can you take this spirit that I feel in you toward the Hebrews in Demona and impact upon the Knesset and the head of the country? What I've said today and what I've said in other times, I've had opportunity to be in the community. <coughs> They're not, these are feelings that we have. These are my feelings that I have and feelings that of all the people in Demona, and in this direction, that we meet those that we need to meet. If it's ministers, if it's Knesset members, we need to explain to him all the subjects of the community that these things that we speak of are spoken of to everyone that we speak to the ministers and to Knesset members. And I hope that those things that we say to them here, at the end of things, that will come to the conclusions and for the purpose of the community, there will be citizenship for the community. He's not a prophet, but you got it. <laughs> <laughs> we will continue together with those members of the community until we come to the conclusion. When the Ministry of Housing established a new community in Demona, a new neighborhood in Demona, we wanted them to consider having the community to give them at least a part of the community, a part of the neighborhood that they can live there. Unfortunately, the whole neighborhood was already sunk, and it has shows it has shown us what our feelings are and what our feelings are towards the community. Keon was referring to the desperate need for more housing for the African Hebrew villagers. Currently, families are living in overcrowded homes, and in some cases, as many as 30 people are living in one dwelling. The question still remains, why won't the Israeli government grant citizenship status to a group of peace-loving people? The dilemma seems to be over the African Hebrews' claim that they are the original inhabitants of the land currently referred to as Israel. When you came here, there was a question of whether you had a legal right to be a part. A law was passed, simply stated that if people claim they are, are Jews, they can come back to the land. Are you claiming you're a Jew? What are you claiming? I am a Hebrew Israelite, my nationality, my tribal origin, I am a Jew. There is a significant difference historically. We must go back and understand that there were 12 tribes making up the family of the 12 tribes of Israel. If you were a descendant of the tribe of Judah, you were a Jew. If you were a descendant of the tribe of Simon, you were a Simonite, Levi a Levite. To refer to a Levite as a Jew in the days of our fathers would have been very, very insulting. So never in our true history has the entire nation of Israel been referred to as Jews. When our fathers used the term, it only meant a descendant of the tribe of Judah or one that dwelled in Judea. But when referring to all of us collectively, we were referred to as the children of Israel, Israelites, or Hebrew Israelites. I am a Jew. But I'm, when I say that I am a Jew, I am simply referring to my tribal origin. And when I refer to my national origin, I am a Hebrew Israelite. A Hebrew as a descendant of Abraham and an Israelite as a descendant of Jacob. I later posed the question to Prince Asiel, what is the biblical proof that connects the African American to Israel? One of the prophetic keys that we unlocked was in the book of Genesis, the 15th chapter, and the 12th verse to about the 15th verse, it said that a vision came to our father Abraham. He said, know of a surety 
that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them and afflict them 400 years. And afterwards, I will then bring you back to this land. Then we went to the book of Deuteronomy, 28th chapter, 68th verse, and said, Thou shalt go into Egypt again, this time by ships, and there you shall be sold as male and female slaves, and no man shall buy you. In order to confirm whether or not the children of Israel were people of African descent, we went to the 10th chapter of Genesis, and we looked at the sons of Ham. Ham, one of the sons of Noah, had four sons himself. In the language of the Bible, Cush, Ethiopia, Put, Libya, Mitzrayim, which is a Hebrew word for Egypt, Egypt, one of the sons, and then Canaan land. Canaan land became Israel. We consulted a notable biblical scholar who explained one origin of African presence in the Bible. Genesis 10, 1 refers to the sons of Noah as Shem, Ham, and Japhet, who themselves had sons after the flood. Genesis 10, 6 refers to the Hamites as the sons of Ham, who inhabited North and Northeast Africa. The sons are Cush, which is present-day Ethiopia, Mizoram, present-day Egypt, Put, present-day Libya, and Canaan, which is present-day Palestine, Israel. The African presence is still visible in Israel today. There are thousands of African Palestinians who live in Israel with deep roots to the land, whose ancestors date back for centuries. I met with Ali Jadah, tour guide, and the informal mayor of the African Palestinians in Old Jerusalem. I asked him about his life and relations between the Afro-Arabs and the Jews. Well, life for him, I think it's the hell. I'm one of those people who had experienced that. To be Palestinian, that's a big problem. But to be a black Palestinian, I'm quite convinced it will be the hell. Because uh, as a black Palestinian, I am uh, double oppressed. Double oppressed by the Israelis. In what way? In what way? I will explain. First of all, they... First of all, they oppress me as a Palestinian. You see. Uh, secondly, they oppress me because of the, my color. Whenever I go around in the Israeli side, they call me Kushi. Kushi means nigger. Kushi means nigger. So, in Israel, the land of God, people who were the brothers of the Arabs, two brothers, you are called nigger as I am called nigger in America? Uh, Let's say on the surface, uh, this is what they say, that this is the land of God and uh, we are cousins and there should be total equality. But once you come to the practice, when you come on ground, you will find that there is a lot of discrimination and there is a real divorce, real divorce uh, between what they say and what they exercise. Blacks and whites who watch the show say, so why stay? Why stay? when you are called nigger every day? Why stay when you are denied your rights? On the contrary, uh, they never, they, the more they humiliate me, the more they oppress me, the more I stick to my land. Because this is my land. I'm so rooted. We are deeply rooted as Africans, as Palestinian Africans in this land. And we know pretty well that our ancestors, I'm talking about thousands and thousands of years, we had been here in this country, but they were spread away, taken to Africa, in the United States. So, uh, the more they exercise brutality, the more they exercise oppression against me, the more we are determined to stay because this is our homeland and we have a message, we have a holy message that this land should be the land of real peace, not the false peace that they are talking about it now. As I did the interview, I couldn't help but be amazed at the dismal setting. We were in old Jerusalem, in the city of Walls, sitting in an old jail called Prison's Gate. It had been built by the Mamluks, the Mamluks. Which are? They are Arabs, Muslims, who came from Syria and occupied this area. We are talking about a period of uh, 1,358. 
about six, seven hundred years old, this place. Then afterwards, this place was taken by the Turks when the Turkish Empire occupied the whole area over here. So those places were transferred to jails. The origin is those places were built for pilgrims, people who come from Mecca, outsiders. So the Mamluks wanted some places where they can stay, where they can serve them, give them food, and they have toilets, all these things. But once the Turks came over here, they transferred those places to prison. In the place you are sitting just now, they used to locate people who were sentenced to life, while in the other section, they used to locate people who were sentenced to death. Okay, I have a dream. I have a dream. It's not only me, all my people over here, that they will come and will have uh, better conditions so that we can move from this prison, you see. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's not only the name that gives it that definition, it's a prison. And the name is? In the meantime, I can say the whole area, the whole place that we are living is a prison, is a jail. Not just this building? No, not just this building. I'm talking about, in general, about the total situation. You can live in a very bombarded villa, apartment, outside, but you are still in jail because you are deprived of your freedom, of your uh, freedom of expression. Try to imagine I'm living in a big villa, a millionaire, I have a Pontiac, 1997, once I go in the street, they call me nigger. So what does it mean? It's nothing. It's nothing in front of the, uh, my self-dignity, my personal dignity, my human dignity. I think uh, I can talk that we are living in a big jail. <laughs> But amidst all the politics is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is the site where Christians believe Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. On the church's rooftop lies an Ethiopian monastery. A group of gentle Ethiopian monks live in tiny cells on the rooftop monastery. Their sole mission is to protect and guard the site they believe is where Jesus was crucified and buried, and to be caretakers of their property. I was honored to be granted a rare interview with Father Yasus about their commitment. Abba, how long have Ethiopians been in this area? Come as man Ethiopian can by Ezor has a over fifteen hundred years. So why has it been so difficult for him to hold for the Ethiopians to hold on? this land. So originally we had a number of places here, not just this place, but uh, we were spread out all over this area. Afterwards, there was a problem, there was a war. Mm -hmm. And because of that, only Christians could uh, take this place. And they pressured them and put them out, and then they began to move to establish uh, their tents, uh, residences here uh, on the roof. And now because the Egyptians and the Armenians have taken much of their places here on these holy spots. Ken. Just the area, surrounding area is theirs here in the old city. How long can they stay here? How long are they prepared to stay here? He said they're ready to stay forever, forever, forever long, for however long. Are you guarding the tomb of Jesus? He said we are, we are guardians. He said despite the problems with the Egyptians and the Armenians and others, we are guardians, and we are here to maintain that. And 
What makes him stay? Lama ta Mishayerpo. He said, I added him, I added, because the life is very hard here. He said, the life is not hard here. He said he, he remains because he desires to maintain a holy uh, a presence, to pray holy prayers for the, and maintain the African presence here. As I continue to trace the African presence in Israel, I journeyed to a town called Rahat, where I met with El Abid. And while he's also an Afro-Arab, his experiences in Israel are quite different from Ali Jada's in Old Jerusalem. How do you get along with the Israeli government? He said, they he said, nobody is bothering or disturbing them. They live here freely. He's saying nobody is bothering them. The children are able to run freely and they're without any problems. They have good relationships and everything is open. So then what opinion does he have of African Americans? The time is, he hopes and uh, prays that the blacks in America begin to become unified and work together to overcome the situations that exist for them at this point. So if he had a message to give to African Americans on how we can do that, what would that message be? He says black Americans need strong leadership, sincere leadership that will lead and guide them in the right manner. What does he see as our future? He said uh, that black Americans have continued to be slaves to white America. And if you don't uh, develop that strong leadership and begin to work in solidarity hand in hand, there will be no future. There is no future. He sees no future. Ironically, Mr. Apid felt there was no future for African Americans if we didn't start working together as a people. I noticed that the African Hebrew Israelites in Demona were already practicing unity. Many of them live in a section of Demona they have named the Village of Peace. They have a communal lifestyle similar to a kibbutz. The only difference is they don't have the agricultural component. Village members share everything, including the community cafeteria to the guest house, as well as each other's bathrooms. Sharing is a way of life, and it begins at breakfast when the women of the village come together in joyful harmony to prepare the meals of the day. No child goes hungry, and every effort is made to see that every child has a breakfast and lunch. Dinner is a family event served in the home. These transplanted African Americans have given up soul food as a traditional mainstay in their diet. The African Hebrew Israelites adhere to a strict vegetarian way. Their diets are devoid of meat and dairy products. Tofu forms the basis for a majority of the meals, but don't think the food isn't delicious. We visited a tofu processing factory and got the surprise of our lives when we learned the number of ways tofu can be prepared. From milk to fancy spreads to ice cream, the Hebrew Israelites have become experts at making tofu taste like ordinary food. Almost everything used by the villagers is made in the village of peace. The first thing we noticed was the spectacular array of clothing worn by everyone, all made in the sewing center, one of the busiest hubs in the village. Approximately 95% of everything that we wear is made right here in this facility. Can the women just come at will and sew, or do they have to have an appointment? Well, um, they have to have appointments. However, when there's an open spot, they can just come and sit down. The Village of Peace in Demona is a place where a holistic way of life is at the core of everything, from what they eat to what they wear, and even to giving birth. The House of Life Healthcare Facility is almost exclusively a birthing center. 
The villagers credit the phenomenon to the healthiness of the community based on a holistic lifestyle. Since opening in 1971, more than 700 babies were born without drugs or unnecessary surgery. Yeah, this is the birthing room. Right. We're brought into an environment, first of all, that's holy, that's quiet. We have our own midwives, mm -hmm. so it's an uncomfortable atmosphere, as well as one of our priesthoods stands outside of the door mm -hmm. reading certain prayers so that the mother will be more relaxed and more comfortable, and the baby will come into a world, and one of the first things you'll hear is a prayer, the words of Yah. The villagers believe that everything they do must be to the glory of God. The teachings begin with the very young, the future of the village, the children. The villagers sacrificed everything to build a school for their children, a school that has become the center for education for the whole community. A second grade teacher whose teaching technique has become a motto in Israel is Samaki about Israel. She shows us why her students learn so quickly. In the United States, there's a book called The Bell Curve. It says that children who are born in poverty, black children, cannot learn. These children came to a bomb shelter. How do you respond to the theory that the environment impacts on learning? Well, it goes back again to the environment, as you stated. It's a positive environment, an enriching environment, and children, I don't think it's not a child in the world that is not able to learn. First of all, I say again, you have to facilitate the environment with positivity, with projection. And then that child sees that, and he's willing and all desire to be molded in that way that you want him to be molded in. Final question. There is an argument, a debate in the United States that religion cannot be taught in school. We know as we watch this class that religion, spirituality is a part of it. How do you feel about the American debate? First of all, let's go back and make a slight correction here. Correction I like to make is the fact that religion, in our lifestyle here, our lifestyle is based upon the Holy Scriptures. And I like to say that in our lifestyle, it's not religion, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle the children pray when they enter the classroom. It's a lifestyle the diet the children eat. It's a lifestyle of the divine dress code. Everything we do here is a divine lifestyle. The children were anxious to show us how much they had learned, so they gathered together in the school courtyard for a special Our Voices tribute. We are now going to recite the seven prophetic stations of the kingdom of Yah. Holla. One, and to this coming out of America, 1967. Two, the establishment of the kingdom of Yah. Three, the formulation of the doctrine of the kingdom of Yah. Four, the prayer of the Lord for the kingdom of Yah. Five, to acknowledge the holy Shabbat day. Six, pray whether in the flesh or the spirit toward the holy temple of Yah. Or Jerusalem is spiritually centered for the redemptive struggle. Look at me, I'm a testimony. Look at me.
despite the trials and tribulations they face in Israel, the villagers have managed to carve out a way of life. New families are constantly beginning. Weddings are a major celebration in the village, and sometimes the ceremony doubles. And there is singing and dancing and celebration when Prophetic Destiny, the village's star singing group, did a final performance the night before they left for a tour in Nigeria, Africa. And what you have seen is only a part of our journey in Israel as we search for an answer to the question, why Israel and not Africa? Oh.